You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Thursday. March 2nd, 2017, my name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Rebecca Given, Associate Professor, the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers University on labor's power in an era of privatization. Meanwhile, Jeff Sessions. It appears he lied in confirmation hearings about Russian contacts. Shocking. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. (laughs) How are you to do? Well... See, I belong to a certain secret society. House Republicans uh, refuse to show their repeal and replace plan, even to other Republicans. Meanwhile, U.S. jobless claims lowest in 44 years. America's great again. And Antarctica. Not in America, but it's the warmest ever. Bannon may have a new means to destroy our regulatory agencies. And the Justice Department no longer will argue that the Texas voter ID law is discriminatory. Lastly, Republicans pouring money into a Georgia congressional race to fill the seat of the Health and Human Services Secretary, Tom Price. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, uh, well, another one of those nights, right? On, uh, thought I was going to go to bed early, 10.30. Again, they drop it. Um... We'll go into more detail afterwards, but there's a couple of things I noticed about this story. Um, So Jeff Sessions was asked directly by Al Franken during his confirmation hearings as to uh, whether or not, in fact, let's play this. Here is Al Franken asking Jeff Sessions, the attorney general nominee, Just, I mean, just to mind your P's and Q's, I guess. Have you ever had any contact with the the Russians during the course of this campaign? Now, what's interesting about this is, I don't know what day. Do you know what day this took place, Matt? Um, This is January 10th? Because following this, there were written questions that Patrick Leahy sent to Jeff Sessions. Now, there's a couple of things that's interesting about this, but um, here is Senator Al Franken asking his colleague, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions, um, just, uh, just, uh, just to make sure that we're doing our due diligence. You didn't ever talk to the Russians about during the campaign, did you? Okay. CNN has just published a story, and I'm telling you this uh, about a news story that's just been published. I'm not expecting you to know (laughs) whether or not it's true or not. But CNN just published a story alleging that the intelligence community provided documents to the president-elect last week that included information that, quote, Russian operatives claimed to have compromising personal and financial information about Mr. Trump. These documents also allegedly stated, quote, there was a continuing exchange of information during the campaign 
between Trump's surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government. Now, again, I'm telling you this as it's coming out, so, uh, you know. But if it's true, it's obviously extremely serious. And if there is any evidence that anyone affiliated with the Trump campaign communicated with the Russian government in the course of this campaign, what will you do? Senator Franken, I'm not aware of uh, any of those activities. I have been called a surrogate at a time or two in that campaign, and I did have, not have communications with the Russians, um, and I'm unable to comment on it. Very well. I've been called a, a surrogate for a time or two, and I did not have any communications with the Russians. Now, what's also interesting, and maybe I'm projecting some of this on this, but if you see the video of this, uh, it's a split screen, and Sessions looks particularly nervous. Now, it's also possible that's just his look. Like, he looks like he's a deer in a headlight, but there does sort of feel like he's thinking, like, oh, my God, what do they All know? of my dreams of a second confederacy will go up in flames. I did not call Mr. Figures boy. What? Oh, no, did not not read with the Russians. Now, look, here is the uh, interesting thing uh, about this. Well, there's other interesting things about it. But um, there seems to be two strands of poor reporting here. The Washington Post first came out with their story. And a former Justice Department uh, aide, and now a current aide for Jeff Sessions, or I should say vice versa, former Senate aide, now a, a Department of Justice, confirmed that Jeff Sessions incidentally met with the Russian ambassador at a group function where there was a bunch of other people there in July, and then met with him in September, on September 8th. The September 8th part comes actually from a Politico uh, piece. But Washington Post says September that they met in Jeff Sessions' office. The Wall Street Journal says that there was a phone call now, that would make for three contacts. And the reason why, now, it's quite possible the Wall Street Journal just got it wrong, that what they are attributing to a phone call is actually the meeting in the senator's office. Now, the reason why the phone call thing is important, it seems to me, because subsequent to this exchange, Patrick Leahy wrote, a written question to Jeff Sessions. And the question was, quote, several of the president-elect's nominees or senior advisors have Russian ties. Have you been in contact with anyone connected to any part of the Russian government about the 2016 election, either before or after Election Day? Sessions responded with one word, no. Now, this is not a very smart question for Patrick Leahy to ask. It really should have been a two-part question, right? Have you been in contact with anyone connected to any part of the Russian government, either before or after Election Day, would be question one. And then question two would be, if so, was it in regards to the 2016 election? But by making it specific to the 2016 election, Sessions has a deniability. I met, and his argument now is, I met as a senator with the ambassador, even though there was really no reason I can think of as to why I would have met with him in my office. It was probably just to get some vodka. That's just but, spitballing idea. But here's the point. This is a bad question by Leahy, unless Leahy, subsequent to that story in CNN or that came out, and subsequent to those hearings, got wind that there was actually a transcript because foreign ambassadors are, their phones almost by just their very nature are tapped and knows what the content of that conversation was or at least has a vague notion of it and was asking an even more specific question so that subsequently there would be a, a problem with his response. I don't know. 
I don't know if the Wall Street Journal uh, reporting was just sort of wrong and it wasn't a phone call. I think we'll have a better sense in the coming days. I don't know. But it's just one thing uh, I thought you should note. Now, we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, later in the program because uh, we have clips of Jeff Sessions uh, talking about in the past how important it is for our elected officials to be truthful. Rule of law. Definition of is is. Well, definition of it, we ain't in some postmodern morass where the F- president lies to the republic. Fallatio. And Doc is used my water fountains. <laughs> what? Excuse me. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Fallatio. Fallatio is um, fallacious. And uh, so we have uh, we have clips on that. We'll talk more about this. But uh, it's just good Alabama boy who won't protect this country values and tradition. What's interesting is that uh, Jeff Sessions was not one of those guys. I mean, look, just for a moment. Now, at the time, Jeff Sessions was sitting on Donald Trump's Foreign Advisory Committee. Jeff Sessions has a history of a disposition towards Russia, which I think is probably uh, was on the belligerent end of the spectrum. So for some reason, I mean, there's really only two narratives here, right? One narrative is the Trump administration entered in, and maybe it didn't come from Donald Trump. This is a very, I think, charitable reading. Came in with the foreign policy objective of forging a stronger alliance with, uh, with Russia, building better relations with Russia. And I think there's a very strong argument that that's a smart thing to do. But put that aside for a moment. Jeff Sessions would not be the guy that you would naturally go to when you wanted to do that as a foreign policy guy, right? I mean... Let me give you two words, uh, Mr. What is that? Seder, <laughs> if you will. Well, Seder is actually the Russian uh, mob guy who was a special advisor for Trump. I think you'll find that he had a rather different heritage. But anyways, being as that may, two words, Rosneft and purity. (laughs) (laughs) And so uh, Sessions, I don't know, seems to me that if you're Jeff Sessions and you've had what is a fairly unique meeting with the Russian ambassador in your office as a part of a committee you're not the chair of this committee. You're just one of the members of the committee. No one else on the committee thought in September, while well, this stuff we're doing with Russia requires me to meet with the ambassador. In fact, none of them met with him in 2016. You would just think that you would remember, like maybe Alabama's shipping rice. Hey, Bodogoski, you know, I remember as you say, I never call him boy. <laughs> it's for the moment. It could have been just like... You are from Ku Klux of Klans. I know this. You just want help make America be pure and clean. We'll say this. How many points you want that Rosneft deal? I will say this, that um, if you're the Russian ambassador, there's really only two places that you could probably meet with, um, with someone and, get, and be assured that you're not being wiretapped. One would be in the probably secret room that they have in the Russian uh, embassy that they have swept for all sorts of listening devices where they go in there, the quiet room or whatever it is. And then the other would be in the office of a a senator. And while we're at it, is there a a Natasha that perhaps I could purchase, (laughs) Mr. Ambassador? All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Rebecca Given on her piece, Challenge to Change, Reforming Healthcare on the Frontline in the U.S. and U.K. We'll be right back after this.
We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Rebecca Given. She is a professor at the uh, Labor Studies and Employment Rela- of, I should say, Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers, author of Challenge to Change, Reforming Healthcare on the Front Lines in the U.S. and U.K., and uh, you have a piece that is adapted uh, from uh, Challenge to Change in the Jacobin magazine, um, after privatization, that outlines, uh, in this instance, a case study of how unions and labor empowered themselves following a the privatization of of some hospital services in in the UK. Um, yep. Thanks so much for joining us. Let's let's just go through. So, give us the the broad strokes of of this case study, um, and sure. then we can talk about how this applies to uh, the U.S. Uh, both in terms of healthcare, but uh, more broadly speaking. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. The um, the case that uh, that I, I wrote about here was um, an interesting case. I see it as kind of labor and workers. Uh, I guess in some sense losing the war, but but winning the battle. So um, in the UK, there's been a whole uh, sense that because public spending needs to be cut, the way to uh, have any capital improvements in public services, including health care, but not limited to health care, was to have these partnerships with, where private providers had the ability to profit from them. And in the case of hospitals, that meant the private uh, providers would build a new building and provide all of the kind of non-medical, non-clinical services. So the food, the cleaning, the any kind of facilities, maintenance, um, labs, often payroll, back office. They wouldn't provide any clinical services, so all the doctors and nurses were still public employees. But everything else that was going along and control of everything was by these private companies. And these private companies were actually sort of consortia of investors. So this was a very lucrative and profitable area. There was actually, I read about, there was an uh, overabundance of investment opportunities. So the investors were in a really strong position. And they built these new hospitals. They called it design, build, maintain, and operate. Um, So they were designing them, building them, maintaining them, and operating them. All four of those areas are areas where there's the potential for profit. And the people who work in those hospitals were having to deal with the with the consequences. So, if you were and a I should doctor, say just yeah, a, a couple of things, just to interject here. One is that, um, in some respects, uh, to the extent that we have any idea of what uh, the, the the supposed infrastructure bill that we're going to see from the Trump administration, th- there's there's quite a bit of this dynamic involved in it. And it also the arrangement also sort of sounds like uh, what you see in. Um, uh, arenas in this country where yes. where you have like, uh, we're going to build this thing and we're going to get to operate concessions and you field the basketball team. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So there's a, this whole, it's it was called the private finance initiative. And there were a couple of motivating features behind it, which I think are very similar to what's being bounced around with the, with the apparent infrastructure program under the current presidential administration. So one is the idea that we want a new thing, let's say a new hospital, but we don't want to have it appear on the public balance sheet. We don't want it to look like part of the public budget. So we will have a private entity build it and we'll essentially pay rent. We'll pay it back over a certain number of years, um, often 30, sometimes 50 years. So a very, very long period of time. And in the meantime, we will give this private entity the opportunity to profit from it, right? So to essentially set their own prices for whether we're talking about concessions in a stadium or um, cleaning and meals in a hospital. So there are lots and lots of places where you can find profit in this. Meanwhile, the public, the public uh, entity, so the taxpayer, is locked into a lease, uh, you know, into a contract paying for the building and the services, no matter what happens to demand over that long lease period. And um, they also essentially still have the risk. So some of the people that I talked to over the course of the research talked about um, – privatizing the profit but publicizing the risk. In other right. words, the public still holds on to the risk. If the hospital fails, those people still need health care, right? If the stadium or the road doesn't work, the public 
purse is ultimately going to be bailing it out. But the profit doesn't come back to the public. The profit stays with those shareholders, those investors. So there's kind of a mismatch, only for the sake of making it look like the taxpayer wasn't funding it, when really it's the taxpayers not funding it up front, and uh, there's a lot of private profit being pulled out of the whole deal. Indeed. And, and, and this also reminds me, I think, of what happened in Chicago with the um – with the uh, uh, the parking meters, the parking meters, the fam- the infamous parking meters. That's exactly right. And uh, what often happens, and you see this, and I would almost categorize it as quality of life. So with the parking meters, I think a lot of the backlash had to do with the users of the parking meters. Right? right. They were frustrating. They were more expensive. And you actually see this in hospitals. So um, you see this also in in even public prisons in the U.S. So those fees for you know so-called users. So in hospitals, the TV and the phone fees where you have to put in a credit card to use the phone or to uh, have access to TV in prisons. I know the uh, things like phone call fees or commissary fees, which may or may not be operated by the private sector. But you get these sort of uh, new new places to find profit, where when a private provider whose primary motivation is profit is seeking, is, is seeking any profit in any little nook and cranny that they can find, they find all these areas. And the users who are already paying for this in the form of taxes get, uh, you know, charged a second time. All right. So uh, so this is the dynamic that we're looking at uh, that took place in, in, mm-hmm. in Great Britain. And this raises, because you've got uh, investors who are, are, are not necessarily operators of a um, of cleaning services or of uh, uh, you know uh, working the concession stands as it were in mm-hmm. a hospital or, or providing food yeah. or catering services, they then hire just an array of essentially they contract this out and and this yep. is where uh, so tell us uh, take it from there. Yeah, so the investors are just big investment companies that, you know, they have uh, offices in the city, the British equivalent of of Wall Street, and they're just looking for uh, money-making opportunities. And they partner with uh, some of the actually same companies that are really global conglomerates now. So it could be a Sodexo or an ISS. Those are big companies that uh, Sodexo people are familiar with from food. ISS is kind of general hospital support services and cleaning services, not in hospitals. So some of these kind of global service conglomerates that are highly, highly profitable, really economies of scale and sort of, you know, providing uh, whatever it is, food or cleaning services. And they hire the, uh, the workers to do the work. Although in actuality, we get into layers of contracting, subcontracting, and sub-subcontracting because sometimes they're paying so little they are having trouble recruiting, so then they're going to temp agencies, um, and so they're often workers doing the same job who might be uh, working for multiple temp agencies. The the hospital that I wrote about here, one um, one person I interviewed said that there were people on nine different sets of employment terms and conditions doing the same job, right? So when you add up all those temp agencies and different kinds of recruitment. And uh, these uh, employers, not only are the workers not getting uh, the stability and the pay of the public employment, they were were potentially getting, you know, much worse terms and conditions. You see um, over time in the account that I write that they were actually able to push back in, uh, in pretty significant ways. But in the first instance, it was essentially taking what was a very stable public sector job where even if you were sort of lower on the status ladder, you were cleaning a hospital ward, you still had a stable long-term job with decent benefits and uh, some investment in that community. So you cleaned the same part of the hospital every day. You interacted with doctors and nurses and, um, you know, there was the ability to have a long-term relationship, to have pride in your work in, in that sense. And when it goes into this profit-driven model, it's much more of a race to the bottom. These become high turnover jobs that are equivalent to, you know, McDonald's or Walmart or any low-wage job that people take for potentially uh, as little time as possible before they move on to the next thing. I mean, I, I can't help but think that, you know, when I think about this model um, that in the States that the, the, the post office is sort of yeah. viewed as a potential – you know, I, I can't help but think that there is there's there's there are private entities out there, ranging from uh, UPS and FedEx 
to just um, uh, holding companies that are just looking at the post office as this sort of huge potential for a similar dynamic. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And there's a few things that happen with the privatization. One is that anything that can be profitable is desirable and, and can be sold off or contracted out. And then what's left, it's the same thing as we think about with um, you know, health insurance and risk pools. What the government is left paying for are those services that maybe we as a society think that we need, but that aren't highly profitable. So with the post office, I would say, you know, rural mail delivery, right? right? That's much more expensive per household than urban mail delivery. So all of a sudden, you've got what was subsidizing the most expensive uh, service taken away for private profit, and the taxpayer is paying for the most expensive part without that built-in sort of equalizing or, or subsidy. So you have, um, you know, that, that uh, mismatch, and then it becomes, look how expensive this mail service is when we've actually, you know, disrupted the model so much that it can no longer pay for itself. So uh, I think, yes, that's, that's a huge problem. And you get the same thing in, um, in any kind of health insurance, right, where uh, people end up uh, finding you know, there, there are a lot of providers who want to provide, um, let's say, knee replacements or other uh, lower risk, lower cost surgeries, but then you get to, you know, very complex multiple diagnosis uh, patients who are very poor and the government is providing that safety net, right? So it's the same reason that we think um, it's good to have healthy people in a risk pool with, with right. less healthy people. It's it's kind of the same thing with something like the post office, right? We want to have that cheaper urban mail delivery in the same cost bucket as the more expensive rural mail delivery. Otherwise, eventually, uh, one is going to be farmed out for profit, and rural mail delivery may just not exist. So, all right, so uh, how does labor in this situation, I mean, and, and, and if there's, uh, you know, if you can give us like a maybe a broad strokes case study in this country yeah. where you see frontline um, uh, workers who have the ability, and I think at one point you described it as being sort of rather than uh, top down, it is the sort yeah. of the, the, the frontline workers creating the policies uh, yeah. By the nature of the way that they're, I guess, approaching their work and approaching their relationship with management. Yeah. So I'll give one example. It's a little outside of privatization, but I write about it in the book, and I really think it shows how the frontline workers can kind of take that workplace power, build it up, and um, and use it to change policy. So um, this is again not 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 a privatization case, but a cost cutting case. So. Um, in uh, San Francisco, General Hospital was kind of the epicenter of HIV and AIDS and treating patients. And uh, I write about a nurse by the name of Lorraine Tebow. She was a nurse. She was a member of SCIU. And in San Francisco, General Hospital, uh, there were a number of horrible needle stick injuries, including um, a nurse who contracted HIV and, and died because of a needle stick injury, right? And it's pretty clear, even you don't have to have any expertise to understand that should never happen, right? There should never be um, a workplace injury like that. Um, but what the nurses uh, at the hospital realized was that safety needles were available. So if you think about going to the hospital and, giving, and getting blood taken or, you know, shot, there are the needles where the, um, the pointed part of the needle actually retracts. So those are considered safety needles. And they have existed for a couple decades, and they're more expensive than the kind of old-fashioned type of needle. They cost maybe 50 cents more. Um, and the nurses in that hospital said, you know what? We just had a nurse die because you were too cheap to buy safety needles. So they brought a grievance, a grievance under their collective bargaining agreement, and they won. So then they had safety needles in their hospital, and that was great. But they said, you know what, we want to secure this. So the next time bargaining came around, they uh, put it in their collective bargaining agreement. And that was great. And they started talking to the other nurses in other hospitals nearby, and they started getting it in their collective bargaining agreement. But then they kind of said, well, you know, not every hospital has unionized nurses. So let's think about how to... Uh, protect our sisters and brothers in, in other hospitals. So they actually, this was all happening in California. They went to the state legislature and they said, let's pass legislation around, around safety needles. And they got it passed so that it was in every hospital. 
And then eventually, although it took a lot of back and forth, they got it, uh, an improvement to the OSHA standard on the federal level so that federally it was around. And for me, that's a story of, you know, that frontline power. So not only did they have a union, but they were able to use the grievance procedure to say, you know what? Yes, we understand that you're going to be interested. And this was a public hospital, but you're going to be interested in saving money. But that is not enough. This is, you know, and a worker, a worker safety issue is also a patient safety issue, right? If worker, if nurses are getting injured on the job, then they're then they're not on the job. It's harder to keep numbers of staff at work. There's a greater chance of people leaving the job, and the experienced nurses aren't there. So that's a problem not just for the injured or sick nurses, but but for the patients as well. And so we sort of see the workplace power of having a grievance procedure and being empowered to use it and having a collective bargaining agreement creates a better workplace there. And then that expertise, that ability to go before Lorraine Tebow te testified before Congress and said, this is the situation. I've had coworkers die because of this. This is why it needs to change. I'm using my frontline experience and my frontline knowledge to demonstrate this to you, and you ought to respect that and not listen to, let's say, you know, accountants or bureaucrats or whatever sort of insulting category you want to use, but listen to the people that are actually in the trenches at the coalface. And so, okay, uh, there's a couple of things that that, that, that that strike me. I mean, one being that this is this is almost like exactly the type of regulation you would anticipate will be rolled back under a <laughs> under, yes. under a Trump yeah. administration. I mean, uh, this is the classic example of uh, the federal government forcing hospitals uh, yep. to to spend money on stuff that they are better suited to make a determination as whether or not it's necessary. Um, yeah. But aside from 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 that danger, so is there a are, are there examples of a ways in which labor can enforce those type of things in the absence of of codifying it regul in terms of regulation? Also, yeah. are there examples where I mean, because the grievance process, right? Like this is an example of something that seems like a slam dunk question, right? I mean, someone died. Right. Um, yes, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be difficult. Someone died, and there's a clear fix. There's something you can do to make it never happen again. This looks like the low hanging fruit, and yeah. you also had a sort of a perfect. Maybe it's just perfect in retrospect, as you as you tell the story. But you had a sort of a a a, a tiered. An, an, an ascending tier of of sort of like goals, which then could be leveraged, right? First, it's the yeah. um, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 grievance uh, on, right. on a union level, and then yeah. you could parlay that, and then parlay that, and parlay that up into the federal level. Oh, sure. What what happens when you don't have both the the, uh, the that low hanging fruit question yeah. of of uh, of worker safety, and also not as I think, um, as a, a, a stepped process. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, one of the things is that what we see now in terms of worker organizing is both, let's, for sake of shorthand, I'll say traditional organizing, where workers are organizing to have a, you know, official union recognition and getting a collective bargaining agreement, but we also see a lot of non-traditional organizing, right? So, let's say protests around wage theft, right, where you're not actually seeking a union, you're seeking particular particular uh, redress around a particular uh, issue that happened, right? And so what we see is actually, if you can build workplace power, which, you know, I'm kind of a believer that you have to do it the old-fashioned way with, you know, a lot of organizing, a lot of listening and talking, um, you actually have a number of avenues because you can sit at the bargaining table and in the U.S. we have a lot of rules about what you can bargain over, what you can't officially can't bargain over, although you might do it unofficially. But we also have a lot of avenues for um, putting pressure on employers, whether anything from sort of informal worker action to, you know, leverage in the media or with elected officials. So, you know, a lot of what happens in uh, sort of jump-starting uh, some fixes in the workplace is that workers start to organize and talk to each other, but then they go to either the media or an elected official and say, you know, this is this is what's happening. What can we do about it? Right. And we see uh, many. I mean, the, the more optimistic view, and I'm not trying to suggest that we're in 
a wonderful time for workers' rights. But the more optimistic view is that by having all of these paths, you can uh, deploy many strategies at one time, right? And you can get to a place where, in some cases, you can formally organize a union and you can sit at the bargaining table and negotiate a very strong collective bargaining agreement. And in other places, you're going to be, you know, flying the, flyering the customers or the service users, or you're going to be, you know, trying to get religious leaders or um, the mayor of a city to speak out on your side. So we, what we see is these uh, large number of uh, strategies and tactics that are available to improve working conditions. And when we're talking about the public service, we're talking about working conditions. We're almost always talking about the quality of the service that's available, right? So if it's a hospital, if it's postal delivery, if it's roads, the working conditions are always very, very closely tied to the service quality itself, which is you know, something that's for usually everyone. And, and, and do you have a, a, a an opinion, or have you done any research in terms of the, the different implications on the on the broader approach that perhaps unions or uh, labor organizations are taking relative to sort of the the difference between what, I guess what they call uh, managerial unionism yeah. uh, versus social justice unionism, and 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 for the sake of uh, people who don't necessarily know. Uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, will you just sort of outline those two different approaches? Yeah, I mean, managerial unionism, sometimes called business unionism, is more like a transactional model where you have a union and you your job is to kind of service the current members, negotiate collective bargaining agreements, go through all the transactions that are part of sort of the baseline level of representation for your members. A social justice model takes uh, more of a movement approach and say, you know, for example, the fight for 15, right, which was uh, something that SEIU, a huge union, took a huge part in. Almost every SEIU member was already getting $15 an hour. So that was um, a movement which was motivated by we need to raise wages for everyone, not just our members. Um, and I would say sort of um, – not exactly uh, choosing one of those categories or another, but I would say really a workplace-based unionism is where where we can build power, where we can see uh, workers uh, kind of taking uh, the strength in their own hands and saying, you know what, we are laboring every day and we can we can turn that work into something that can improve uh, the service that we're providing, the work that we're doing. So, for example, uh, that more transactional unionism, it's often dependent on a few leaders, uh, some would call them union bureaucrats, having a particular kind of ongoing relationship with management. Um, and the social movement unionism, there's been uh, some criticism that it's based on turning people out to, let's say, protest. So maybe a union member will go to a protest at a Burger King. Um, but are the Burger King workers at the protest at the Burger King, right? And so if you're looking at more of a deep workplace model, you're saying, you know, let's make sure that workers are engaged and they're making decisions about their own workplace. And then you can feed that up to the leadership of the union. I think, you know, a really good example for me is the Chicago Teachers Union, which a lot has been written about right. uh, in, the, the, in the past few years. Um, and um, having a really deep level of organizing so that those teachers really knew why they uh, were thinking about striking, what the issues were, and they were directly related to their own workplaces, right, from class size to temperature problems with not working air conditioning. Those teachers were building power in their own workplaces. You don't want a situation where you have, you know, a union office in downtown Chicago and every three or four months, they're calling up members and saying, hey, we haven't talked to you in a while, but can you show up at a protest, right? You want a situation where members in the workplace are talking to each other, they're figuring out what their common issues are, what their common ideas for improvement are, and, um, you know, sh utilizing the, the strength that they have, but they don't realize they have unless they talk to each other and really come together. Rebecca Given, the uh, book is Challenge to Change, Reforming Healthcare on the Frontline in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the uh, fun half of the program. I, I have to say, it's, it's social movement uh, uh, um, unionism, but I almost, like now, I don't think I can say the words social uh, Without SJW, like, and I felt like that would have been really awkward. 
uh, for me Peter to Cuck, Peter Cuck, have gone Peter into. Uh, You've never called me to hear my views on labor relations. Well, we're going to go into the fun half and me at hope that we get a uh, hope that we get a call from Gorka. There's, I have reason to believe that he's analyzed our YouTubes and is. I, really I, I have heard rumors about this. Well, I have the, you, you, your Kellyanne Conway videos outperform the ones you do about me. Yet you continue to do those silly voices. It's utterly ridiculous. You could be focusing on her. There's a four to one view ratio, but yet you insist on excoriating me. Well, to if be fair, Dad was around. He sidelined her. I've gone to Social Blade and I've uh, analyzed the <laughs> length of listening on your Melania videos. Uh, and you. <laughs> if Dad, if old Dad was still alive, he'd burn your shtevils. Hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'm still working my way through his book. My father was it, the greatest I'll man in the world, and Arabs are subhuman. Chapter <laughs> three. <laughs> it is really impressive. How many words are in this book? And, you know, it's sort of like, so far, and, and we're getting to the point where, um, where he's going to give us the solution to uh, radical jihad. Radical jihad requires repeating but the, he's gone the magic word. The intellectual history, essentially, of radical jihadism. And... What is fascinating about listening to this book is like you, there are so many words, and only about two dozen of them are relevant to what he's actually saying in the end. And he skips things. He, I mean, it's 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 really interesting. It's it's taught me a little bit about you know like he his whole uh, argument is that um, radical jihadism is. Uh, an existential threat to us, like uh, like, Jews. like fascism and communism and Judaism. And uh, he goes um, to uh, he he cites um, George Kennan, who was Kennan, the Cold War yes. strategist. Oh, yes, wow. yes, oh. who wrote um, the basis of what ended up becoming our sort of long term strategy fight uh, fight. Uh, Soviet Union in the Cold War, and um, but what, you know there's a, there's there's like some very subtle sleight of hand because there's so many words and the sleight of hand just happens in the sort of the innocuous phrases like communism was an existential threat to the United States, which of course is demonstrably false and almost obviously false. Wasn't that communism was an existential threat to the United States? It was that. The Soviet Union and nuclear weapons were an existential threat to the United States. What an Fascism SJW was point. not an existential threat to the United States. Um, the Axis He's powers making a were, category mistake. It well, yes, or a category evasion. If evasion. there was a Muslim because empire that had nukes and ran yes. a significant part of the world and bombed Hawaii yes. with its air yes. force. And this, and the thing is, like, literally, the amount of words to make that sleight of hand, you know, literally like two dozen, right? I mean, communism, he, and he'll just say it like, uh, the Soviet Union and communism were an existential threat to us. Okay, so there he has done, and, and that's all you need to say, Communism, fascism, and radical jihadism, Islamic jihadism, feminism, and well, people but, who don't like Grand Theft Auto, and none of that, with all the granular detail that he, it appears he's giving in the evolution of radical jihadism. Those dozen words, in equating an existential threat with um, the Soviet Union and their weapons and communism is all that it takes for him to sort of essentially take it to the next level. Oh, and these people, and, and what's even, in, in, a, in a certain way, 
that's actually less delusional than people who explicitly talk about Iran as if it was the equivalent of those things, which is what some of these people do. So if you read that Mike Flynn article in The New Yorker that came out, there's two reasons why he became so insane about Iran. And one's kind of understandable, which is that he was a general in Iraq and Iranians helped kill a lot of soldiers there. So there's personal animus, which makes sense. And the other part is he fell under the spell of this guy named Michael Ledeen. Well, yes, Ledeen was one of the total big crackpot, neocon but specifically with Iran. Department of... Yes, but uh, Ledeen is a guy who th- who thinks that Iran is responsible for, like, is connected with Al-Qaeda. He's, t- he's that type of guy. He's a hmm. lunatic. And some of them actually try to make Iran literally be positioned as, like, the strategic equivalent of the Soviet Union, which yeah. is incredible. All right. Well, uh, but Absurd. I will. Uh, but I will. I will give you all a, a greater report when I get to the, to the heart of the argument. The uh, Kennan wrote this uh, letter. I can't remember what it was called now. The letter. I think of it something. was the Kennan letter, right? Yes, the Kennan yeah. letter. Well, he's. It's his. <laughs> In yes. Your face. He's. He's. <laughs> he's writing the Gorka letter. The Gorka <laughs> dispatch. I'm writing the George Kennan letter, of this age. If you look at my PhD thesis from the Denny's Culinary Institute Signed in Geostrategic Geo Landmass Counter Terror Strategy. Signed Dr. G. Dr. G. Best the, regards. The Kennan Letter Dr. Part G. Deux. All right. You'll see the strategy. Dear Sam, why are you so self indulgent about the Gorka voice? Folks, um, I'm just sending an email to myself. Because it's fun. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, it is your support that makes this show possible. By becoming a member today of the Majority Report, you're not only supporting the show, but we're giving you a bucket load of free content, of additional content. I guess it's not free at that point. No, it is. It's all free. It's just that um, you pay for just, you pay for the for us to remove um, La Poupée from the uh, closing. That's where that's what it basically is. All the content's free. And uh, no ads in the uh, member show. So please, uh, if you do have the financial means to become a member, please do at jointhemajorityreport.com. Again, if you're one of those folks who are uh, going through a rough patch, um, send us an email at majorityreporters at gmail.com. We don't lock anyone out of the fun half. For financial reasons, I was going to say especially now, but the, the reality is, since since we've had a fun half, we've never locked anybody out for financial reasons. Um, so uh, by all means, uh, join the majority report dot com. If you buy crap from Amazon or from Jet, and Jet has that uh, triple fifteen thing, the first three purchases you get fifteen percent off. You can go to majorityreportkickback dot com, click on the link. Bookmark it. Click on either the Jet uh, link or the Amazon link. Use that as your Jet or Amazon link. Bookmark it. Buy your crap from there, and we get a kickback. Also, don't forget, April 8th at the Bell House in Brooklyn. I remembered it. I think it's like a Bell House NYC, right, dot com? I'm not sure. We've got a link at the uh, front page of majority.fm. Uh, what? You can go to NYC Podfest. Or go to NYC Podfest. Yeah, it's part of the uh, New York uh, Podfest. And it's got quite a lineup uh, this year. Yeah, there is, I want to say Jeremy Scahill. That's not who's in charge of it. His name is Jeremy. It would be very yeah. weird. Scahill. Just <laughs> His name is Jeremy, and he is a young person who has created this whole thing and is it's really scaling up, and he's done a great job. Totally scaling up. Well, uh, and and um, uh, Matt Taibbi and um, Janine Garofalo will be joining us uh, for that program. Uh, so uh, if you want to join us, I think there's still some, still a few seats left. So uh, buy your tickets today. See you in the fun half, 646-257-3920. We'll see you in a minute.